Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. Please um, hold while we wait every, for a few more people to join us here. Um, so wonderful to see you all joining us. Hello and welcome. We will begin here just in a little bit. Uh, we're just gonna wait for a couple more people to join us. All right, I think we will begin. Welcome to Leaving a Positive Legacy, the power of big picture planning. Do you know what kind of legacy you want to leave? Estate planning isn't about death. It's about your happiness, your family's happiness, and leaving a positive legacy. Mike Rogers, president and founder of 360 Financial, will uncover four estate planning secrets to help you understand the opportunity estate planning creates the power of big picture planning and your ability to leave a positive legacy. Throughout the webinar, please add any questions to the chat section. We've allowed time at the end for questions. Also, if you'd like to learn more about 360 and the services we provide, we've um, to provide our clients, stick around at the end of the webinar for a few more minutes. Now I'll turn it over to Mike Rogers, president and founder of 360 Financial. Before establishing the firm in 1995, he spent five years building a solid financial base with two of the nation's largest investment firms. As a fiduciary, he utilizes his 30 plus years of experience to orchestrate and implement customized strategies specifically ta tailored to address the issues and concerns of qualified retirement plan trustees, high level professionals, and thriving business owners. Take it away, Mike. Thank you, Troni. Thank you for everybody for joining us today. Today's program is going to be a little bit different than what you'd normally experience. We're not going to go into a lot of details about what kind of trust to set up and it should be revocable, irrevocable, TODs, PODs. I'm going to talk a little bit about the aspect of planning and how it leads to a positive legacy. And, and really, that's, that's what I think all of us would like to do. Uh, so with that being said, um, I'm going to start with a story. And the story I'm going to start with was a baseball player. And some of you on the, on the webinar might remember Teddy Williams. You know, he, he, in 1939, he emerged as one of the base on the baseball scene from California for the next 19 years after his rookie season, he played for the Red Sox. And when Ted finally retired from baseball, he had hit 521 home runs. He had the highest batting average of any major league baseball player ever, and he was truly a legend. Okay, But baseball isn't the only legacy that Teddy left behind. You might have heard the story back in the early 2000s, but let me share it with you again. Teddy passed away in 2001 at the age of 83. Okay, What happened next became Teddy's real claim to fame. Okay, He was frozen. No, no, really, literally, he was frozen. His head and his body were frozen, preserved in a cryonics lab in Arizona. Now, that seems a little odd, <laughs> frozen lab in Arizona. Um, but 
what it led to instead of him going down in history as one of the greatest baseball players that ever lived, he's gone down as the guy who was frozen potentially against his wishes. And that's where the problem arises. And it's all thanks to a state planning not done right, kind of gone wrong. So what went wrong? And what does this have to do with your estate? And what we like to call at 360 Financial, as Troni alluded to earlier, your big picture plan. So I will get back to Teddy in a minute. Uh, and, and while we're talking about estate planning, a lot of times, Clients will already have goals when they come into the office or potential new clients. They might have a career goal. If not, we'll work on that. They might have retirement goals, lifestyle goals, financial goals. Uh, but what we found is, is when we ask the question about what's your legacy, we don't really have a lot of goals around that question. So, so what we ask is, do you know what kind of legacy you want to leave? At a certain age, this question of legacy starts to come up for all of us. And, and, and uh, I'm much more inclined to be asking it and thinking it now than I was when I started the firm up in 1995 at the ripe old age of 30. Okay. For myself, I know I want to leave a legacy of, of happiness and of positivity. I want the people I care about to feel like I contributed positively to their lives. But what happens if I do all the right things during my lifetime, but leave behind a complex and chaotic estate mess. What's the point if I leave this mess for my children or my wife to deal with when I'm gone? Okay. If my planning is incomplete, or if I don't look at the big picture, I'm leaving behind a legacy of turmoil, potentially resentment, potentially, instead of a legacy of, of happiness and, and contribution. Now, the good news is it can be relatively easy to take care of your estate planning. And I'll talk about getting the right people in the right spots, you know, in order to help with that later in the program. Okay. And by the end of this program, my goal is that you have, is that you leave feeling prepared, feeling motivated, and, and possibly, believe it or not, excited about estate planning. Okay. I know it sounds a little crazy. Who's going to be excited about going through a pile of paperwork and thinking about death? Okay. The reality is that estate planning isn't intrinsically interesting or overly exciting. I get it. You know, Unlike investing, which kind of dangles the carrots of profits and losses and trading and, and opportunities, estate planning doesn't seem to have any real benefit to you while you're still alive. Well, we know that's not the case. Um, and most of us think about estate planning in the wrong way. What is important to know, well, it's important to know who to work with and how to plan. You need to know how to think about estate planning is what I frequently will tell our clients. The last piece is vital. How do we think about the process and how does it benefit our family? So if you think about pl planning the way most people do, you're not going to get the full benefit of what you can leave behind as a legacy. And there's one major roadblock that prevents most of us from embracing our estate planning. Okay. And that is nobody likes to think about death. Most people think that estate planning is focused on death. Even worse, we think it's about our own death. So naturally, we just try to avoid it. That's probably why only 45% of Americans over the age of 55 have any estate planning documents. That's a shocking number. It means that more than half of Americans don't have any sort of estate plan. And it makes sense. You know, you don't sit down on Sunday mornings with a cup of coffee and a stack of blueberry pancakes and consider what might happen to you if you pass away. Many successful professionals will happily spend hours every week watching the stock market go up and down, taking care of their business um, at work, but they haven't reviewed their estate plan in a decade or more, or if 
ever they've reviewed it. So it's not uncommon for really highly accomplished people to leave behind a messy estate that has their family arguing for years. And we're trying to make sure to avoid a situation that a lot of us are familiar with here in Minnesota, and it's the Prince estate. This is a perfect example of, of an estate going wrong. The Prince fiasco um, occurred when he passed away without any estate planning documents in his name, which left his family and the IRS arguing for over six years. Yep, believe it or not, six years. But here's the truth about estate planning and all the big picture financial planning that we try to focus on as a firm. The planning you do today is providing you and your family the peace of mind for the future. Okay. So, Estate planning is not about death. It's about leaving behind a positive legacy and creating family harmony. So again, let me talk, say that one more time. Estate planning is not about death. Okay. I know it kicks in, it's triggered, if you will, at death, but it's not about death. What it is about is leaving and creating a legacy and family harmony. Okay. The minute your estate plan is solidified, you will feel immediate relief. I know this from experience with all the clients over the years I've been doing this. I know there's a background worry that will disappear as soon as you know that you have a plan and the plan makes sense for you and your family. To start creating this positive legacy, you need to know the four secrets of estate planning. So I've broken this down into four different areas. These four secrets aren't things you'll read about in Forbes or the Wall Street Journal, but just from doing this for 30 years, um, actually a little bit more now uh, as a financial advisor, I've seen how vital these four aspects of planning actually are when we wanna leave a positive legacy. But before I get to those four secrets, I wanna share with you a story, um, a very creative and unique story that provided happiness to a specific family member. Okay. So this story is about a comedian named Jack Benny. Jack Benny has not been with us for some time. He passed away in 1974. And he left behind, because he was so successful as a comedian and a showman, he left behind a tidy estate. And that tidy estate had one little request to it. Then he left a provision in his will to ensure that one long-stemmed red rose would be delivered to his wife every day for the rest of her life. So every day for nine years, a local florist delivered a rose to Mary Livingstone's home in New York City. For the rest of her life, Mary woke up to a red rose laying on her doorstep. In this case, Jack Benny left a legacy of of love and of positivity um, that is hard to even match, I think, in today's thought process. He also left a lesson we can all learn from. Even something as unexciting as estate planning can be used to create this happiness factor. It doesn't have to be dry and boring. Estate planning can be very complex. There's lots of documents and there's lots of different terminology that a good attorney, when they're drafting these documents, will make sure you understand. And if you feel worried about thinking about it, you're not alone. But the pathway to a successful estate plan can be simplified as long as you put kind of these four estate planning secrets um, to practice. Okay. Whether you're a newly minted billionaire congratulations if you are, or you're just working to save up your first $100,000 for retirement. These four secrets are going to be critical. So let's, let's get into them. The first secret about estate planning is a little bit of an oxymoron. Secret number one in estate planning is don't keep it a secret. Okay. Believe it or not, 30% of Americans don't know if their parents have a will. And out of that number, 40% don't know what's in their parents' will. Okay. So the parents have done some estate planning, maybe just some basic work around a will, and they have not shared it with anyone. Clearly, many people and many of us like to keep their planning kind of close to the vest, kind of a secret, if you will. Um, one method of estate planning is that as long as you have a will and a trust, you're done. You can check it off your list and you can forget about it. 
Okay. But remember, estate planning is not necessarily about a checklist. It's about leaving a lasting impact with your family. That becomes extremely hard to do if you avoid talking about it with the people you love. Okay. One example that I saw come up with a big extended family was a situation where business dealings with various adult kids had not been revealed to the rest of the family. Okay. Loans had been made at various times to help out certain family members. Okay. When the matriarch of the family passed, these loans were, were revealed because they have to be documented during the probate process. But there wasn't any paperwork to indicate that the loans were to be forgiven or how they might be forgiven. So instead, those loans remained part of the estate. Okay. This created immense conflict within the family unit, as you could imagine. The sad part is this really could have been easily avoided. One of the best ways to prevent future problems like this is to have a family meeting with your financial advisor and your attorney both present. The goal of doing such a meeting is to have a conversation. Okay. And, and I encourage, and you can come up with your own agenda, it just depends on how much you want to share and not share, but we're, we're encouraging communications. And so I've come up with three main things with your family to discuss at the family meeting. Okay, first, you need to share the person who's drafting the estate or the couple, you need to share with your family members, what you want for them. So in this case, patriarch, matriarch of the family are doing most of the talking, okay? Then you wanna turn it around and you want to find out what they want. And I don't mean specifically, oh, I want the blue and white vest that, uh, vase that I received from Aunt Betty. What they mean is, what, what do they want to see happen to your legacy? And finally, and I think this is most importantly, you need to discover what they don't want. And that's going to give you some clues into how to personalize and customize a plan that will satisfy your needs at the family level and be able to leave this positive legacy behind. Can you imagine if Prince would have had a conversation like this, what it would have potentially eliminated as far as the head, uh, the fighting and the head to head um, issues that uh, that the state had to settle. Okay. These conversations, I know they can be complex. Okay. And sometimes they can actually be a little bit uncomfortable. I've done a number of them. And, and, um, and what I like to do is, is kind of bring them everybody together, get everybody sitting down and start this conversation and really just if you will, almost back out of the dialogue, okay? Um, but by having a conversation with your entire family, you can be sure that the planning is going to, to, to address all of the individual needs. And when you're clear on what's important to your family, you can construct a plan that enriches your family's lives in the very best possible way. When you do this, you can be sure you're creating a plan that's truly taking care of the people that you love. And it doesn't really get much better than that. Okay. So let's go on to secret number two. Estate planning, secret number two, is to treat it the same way you treat your taxes. Okay. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, I know taxes are another exciting topic that everybody likes to talk about. Um, but even though you might not enjoy doing taxes, every single year you do them. Or you get them done by a CPA or a tax accountant. Every year without fail, you know, April 15th, and sometimes that date will change or you'll file an extension, but somehow some, somewhere along the line, those taxes are going to have to get submitted. But we can't really say the same thing about reviewing your estate plan. And so that's what secret number two is all about. Let me share a story I heard somewhat recently, believe it or not, about a man who had multiple life insurance policies. And he accumulated these over a lifetime, different phases of his life when he had his business and he had relationships with other financial advisors or insurance agents, he would buy a life insurance policy from time to time. 
Okay. Multiple policies in, in themselves are fine. It, that's not the point of, of kind of reviewing your estate plan. But here's what was interesting. The problem was that when he named the beneficiary, he had the habit of naming his girlfriend at that time. And he never went back and changed this designation when the relationship changed or ended. As a result, when he passed away, his brother, who was the executor of the estate, had to track down an ex-wife and three ex-girlfriends from the past 25 years to let them know that they had money coming to them. Each one of these women said to the brother, I knew I was the one. They had thought he had left the money to them intentionally, when actually he'd simply forgotten to make the changes. Okay. The good thing is, he left a positive legacy, although it was really by accident uh, and not intentional. He probably would have made different decisions if he had spent a couple of hours every year assessing his estate plan. So the most common problems we see from people who don't review their estate plan in an annual cadence are almost always created around life changes like this gentleman here. Okay. Here are a few quick examples. First of all, you know, relationships do change. Okay. They either become better or worse over time. And that might affect how you have your plan drafted and how you want your wishes carried out. Second thing is, kids have kids, and therefore grandkids need to be accounted for. And often we see they don't get added, even though the best intentions of the estate plan is to make sure there is something left for them as well. Okay. And finally, assets change. Okay. They go up and they go down in value. We see that with the stock market, but you see it with all kinds of assets, whether it's farmland, um, housing, uh, vacation homes, they all go up and down in value. And as we know, the government also really likes to change the rules around estate planning. Seems like every administration brings in new estate planning changes. So the tax laws change frequently as well. So if the assets are changing, the laws are changing, uh, and this could really put you beyond the threshold of some of the tax exemptions that you might normally qualify one year and don't the next year. You might need to do some additional, additional planning around those sort of changes. So to make sure you're getting the full benefit of any new laws, you really need to treat your estate plan like your taxes and review it every year, okay? To avoid making these common mistakes, we, we recommend that you create a snapshot, net worth statement of everything you, in your estate. Don't forget to include the insurance you know, that you might have. Okay, that's part of your estate. It does pass on tax-free to the beneficiaries, but it's part of your estate, unless you're doing something with it in a different type of trust. Okay, Don't forget about your investments. Most people understand that, you know, and your real estate and your personal property, you know, and of course you want to subtract out your debt. But when we're taking a snapshot for estate planning purposes, if you have a mortgage, we need to account for that as well. And make sure, especially if you're married, that you're clear about how your assets are titled and who are the beneficiaries. So these are the basic things to do every year. We do it with all of our clients. We have a beneficiary review every time they come into the office. Um, then you should meet with your advisor to discuss what your strategy is. Okay, whether that's us or somebody else that you're already comfortable with and working with, um, and ask them to schedule an estate planning review alongside your portfolio review each year so you don't forget to do it. Okay? Most of our clients come in twice a year, spending one of those meetings with predominantly talking about estate planning issues. This is a prudent strategy. A lot can change in a year. Simply reviewing your plan will actually prevent the majority of the estate planning problems. So, so there's two of the four secrets. And right now I want to get back to 
Teddy Williams for a second, because I told you I would. So in 1992, Teddy Williams, um, before his death, had surgery. He passed away in 2002. In 1992, he had surgery, and he was in the hospital. And just a few days before the surgery, his two youngest children convinced him to sign a scrap of paper saying that all three wished to be frozen upon their death. Although Teddy's will was clear he wanted to be cremated, the scrap of paper was signed four years after his most recent will, which means the court looked at it as overruling his estate planning documents. Teddy's biggest mistake is frankly not doing an annual review. It looks like he just forgot about the scrap piece of paper um, since it was 10 years prior to him passing. And if Teddy had followed the secrets number one and number two, probably likely he would never have been frozen. And his eldest daughter wouldn't have spent years in litigation trying to sort out his estate while the press had a field day with the whole story. If he'd updated his will to reflect his desire to be, you know, frozen and preserved, this would have prevented a lot of litigation and public media that came out as a circus around his legacy. Or, you know, he might have reiterated his desire to be cremated. Either way, it doesn't matter. His wishes would have been clear and up to date. And that's crucial. And what's most importantly important is his legacy would still be intact. It's unlikely that anyone on this webinar I know will have an estate so controversial that it turns into a media frenzy, but it's still critical to review your estate planning documents annually. If you only take one thing from today's talk, the key to estate planning is the annual review. Okay, so let's look at secret number three. And that is, Keep it equitable. One of the biggest myths out there, I think, is when it comes to estate planning, you should always divide your assets equally um, to leave a positive legacy. And typically what I'm talking about here is you divide them up between the number of children that you have, adult children, typically. But often the opposite is true. So let's look at a story about three adult children. And you have one adult children child that lives in the same city as the patriarch and matriarch, you know, as you do. Okay. And that adult child has four kids of her own and she works at a local charity. Okay. She loves her impactful work, but like many nonprofit positions, it doesn't pay very well. And let's give her a name. Her name is Mary, the daughter of mom and dad. Okay. Mary's the youngest. She's also the adult child who provides the most support to you and your spouse. If you're going away on a trip, she's the one who's going to take care of the house for you, and she's going to make sure the cat is fed. Okay, She runs errands for you, and her husband is always helping you out with things that go wrong at the cabin. Okay, You can see that as you get older, she's going to be the one who helps out the most because she lives in the same city as you. Okay. Your other two kids live out of state. They're both successful, high income earners, but because of their jobs, they're only about, they're only able to visit, you know, a few times a year. Okay. So when you're doing your estate planning, if you try to make everything equal in this environment, then you'll want to leave the family home, the cabin, the rest of the estate, to all three kids equally. In your will, you leave, for example, the lake property to all three children. The logic is that they'll have an equal ownership interest in the cab, and then they'll all split it and use it, um, you know, and, and bring their kids up there. Okay. At the moment, that makes a lot of sense. You love them all equally, so why wouldn't you divide the estate up equally? Okay. But here's what can happen later. Okay. Since the out-of-state kids won't really ever use the cabin and they both have big jobs with maybe big mortgages and kids doing their own sports in an out of town state you know they decide they want to sell it after you've passed away mary 
can't afford, afford to buy them out, especially if you look at lake property values these days and how much they've gone up. So she reluctantly agrees to sell the family cabin. She doesn't feel like she frankly has a choice, but she's frustrated at them because she wants to continue the family tradition of going to the cabin, not only with her kids, but also her potential grandkids. Mary wants to preserve the family legacy for generations to come, but because of her career choice, and, and the impactful life that she's leaving, leave, living in a different manner, she doesn't have the finances to buy out the other adult kids, her siblings. So she doesn't have the wealth to support the vision of that legacy. Okay. And this is the problem with trying to create an estate plan that treats everyone equally instead of equitably. So when we've tried to treat everyone the same, frequently we can up with a plan that could have a surprisingly negative outcome. And maybe this cabin story is a good example. In the case of Mary and her siblings, there would have been more than one way to solve this problem. Okay. One simple solution could have been to put the cabin into a trust and set aside a certain amount of money to maintain the place. This way, Mary is able to enjoy the cabin with her kids and grandkids and her siblings don't have to worry about how they're going to pay for the maintenance of the place. The takeaway here is if you focus on your values and treat everyone equitably, we think you'll just end up with a plan that's better for your family. So what's the fourth secret of estate planning? The fourth secret is you have to have good people around you. You need to have the right people in the right places. We use a management system program called Entrepreneur Operating the System here. And we talk about the right places, right seats. And we use the same concept with estate planning. We think the team is critical to make sure that this is carried out. Now, 360 Financial, we don't draft estate planning documents. That's the role of an attorney. Um, and this is, it's become clear to me that the team approach um, is, is, not only necessary for estate planning, but I can relay it back to just the business and the, and the 360 firm that I started up in 1995. So let me share with you just a little bit of history. It's not a commercial, uh, but when I first opened the financial advisory firm back in 1995, I was the ripe old age, as I mentioned earlier, of 30 years old. Okay. I had already been working as a financial advisor for five years for two big Wall Street firms. And, and frankly, it was suddenly clear because my parents were going some, through some health issues that life wasn't going to wait around for me to make the leap to entrepreneurship. Okay. At that time, it wasn't common, it was frankly, very uncommon for financial advisors to go out on their own. It's become more common now, but not so much back then. Okay, um, what we call nowadays going independent, leaving the big firm. But I did see an opportunity. I saw an opportunity, opportunity to provide something truly different uh, to people. So I took a leap of faith and I went for it. I took out a second mortgage, uh, my little St. Louis Park home, and I opened up the firm. My plan was never to become bigger than Merrill Lynch or any other of the big name firm names uh, that are out there. I just wanted to eliminate the problems I witnessed with the big firms and provide a distinctively different and hopefully better level of service to clients. Okay. And, and what ended up happening is it, frankly, it, it worked, thank goodness. You know, when I first opened the firm, it wasn't really much of a firm. Uh, it was actually a closet. Uh, it was in a very small office. I had one room. It was a one-room operation. It was me, Mike Rogers, and we didn't even have a window in that first office. After two years of grinding it out by myself, I was able to finally hire my first employee, get the right person in the right place. And this, this employee was going to help me you know, service our growing client list. This changed everything. My first hire was Kirsten Davidson, who, believe it or not, there's a picture up her up in the top left part of your screen um, has been with us ever since 25 years in the making. Okay. One of the best things I ever did was hire Kirsten and start building 
my dream team. I knew that if I wanted to make an impact and, and provide people the service that they deserved, I needed, I needed help. Now, 27 years later, after starting up the firm, I get to work with a dream team of 19 dedicated associates. We have over 500 clients and our downtown YZ office has walls of glass. Okay. We've come a long way since 1995, but the reason that it's only possible is because we were able to, to bring people together. I got the right people in the right places. So now let's bring it back to the estate planning. And that is what has allowed me to build this business. And it's what's going to allow you to build an estate plan that will meet your family's needs. Every successful person works to build a life that matters to them. We build up assets. We want to pass them along. But even more than that, we don't want our sacrifice to have been for nothing. Okay? When you build something over many years of hard work, you want to ensure it's preserved in a way that leaves a trail of happiness, as we've talked about already but you can't do this alone. Of course, you can create a will like in five minutes online um, or on a piece of scrap paper, maybe like Ted, Teddy Williams did and leave it at that. And some people do it that way. Okay? But when you consider the years you've put into building your assets and building your legacy, you're really shortchanging yourself when you don't get the right people in the right places to support you. And by the way, over on the right-hand screen is a picture out of our window at our YZ location in the lobby. Uh, so we do have windows. Okay. So but when, we, when we look at building a team, I think one example that people make, you know, the big mistake is assigning um, the wrong person sometimes to manage the estate. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about how this looks like a baseball team, but frequently I'll see... Clients come in with some estate planning documents that they had done a number of years ago. And I ask them, you know, who's the trustee of the estate? Who's the executor? Who's the personal representative? There's a number of terminologies that you can use with that. And often I receive, it's the oldest child. And then that just seems logical that that's who they will put into that place. But giving this job to someone isn't really doing them any favors. That's a lot of work. And, and it's really essential to pick the right person to manage this process. So when planning your estate, I tell people, let's think of this like a baseball game. Before you even think of taking the field, first you need to put together a team. It's the same with the estate plan, okay? First you need to consult with your team of experts. You'll want to speak with an estate planning attorney. If you don't have one, we can connect you with some people in our network. You want to have a conversation with your financial advisor, an insurance professional, and your accountant or your CPA. So there's at least four people on this team. Think of these people kind of as your coaches. If you're well, if you're a baseball fan, your managers. They're the ones who will help you build a game strategy, or if you like, help you build your big picture plan. Then you need to assign your fiduciaries. Okay? This means having an executor, a trustee, a power of attorney, or guardians named if there are minor children involved. You can think of your fiduciaries as the players on your team. These people will be doing some of the work, but they won't necessarily be doing the big picture planning. Okay? In the perfect world, your beneficiaries should act more like spectators at a ball game. That doesn't mean that you don't speak with them, as we talked about already, about your plan or find out what they want. It just means that the beneficiaries are apart from the experience. When you're clear about what you want and you have a good team in place, you're not going to be worried about whether it's done right. You'll be sure that it's done correctly. So again, from a baseball perspective, let's assemble your team. And when you know that everything is done and it's been covered and the plan makes sense, now you can relax. You may even find yourself smiling and, and frankly, a little excited. Instead of thinking about it as a complex or tedious item on your to-do list, think of it as a blessing. It's something you get to do, not something you have to do. You get the opportunity to leave a legacy a little bit better than it was before. You'll be able to picture the people you love 
enjoying what you've built with happiness and appreciation for what you've left for them. This is the power of legacy planning. And with that, with the ending, that part of the program. We will do a couple of things here for you. I've spent a lot of time talking about positive legacy and there's a lot of information. So Troni is gonna email everybody who wants it, the webinar, the replay. So we'll get that out to you and you can share that with your loved ones. Okay, we also have a couple other things that we can provide for you to help you with this process. As I know at the beginning of the program, my goal is to leave you feeling prepared, possibly excited about estate planning. We'll share this recording with you, as I mentioned. We'll also give you um, uh, some content, excuse me, about the 11 mistakes to avoid in estate planning. And if you're interested in a checklist or you're interested in some attorney names to help with this dialogue, we can provide that as well. We know everyone's situation is unique and requires a personal discussion. Um, and here at 360 Financial, if you want to have that conversation with us, we look at it as a sounding board. And so we ask that you ask us as many questions and we will um, do our best to answer them or find answers for you as your sounding board. We're going to have a little Q&A session for anything that's come up during the program. After the Q&A, for everybody that's on the webinar that wants to learn a little bit more about what makes 360 Financial unique, uh, please stick around for about you know five to seven more minutes, and I can go into a little bit of those details, at least at a high level view. Troni, I know there's um, probably some Q and A's, um, and I could st yes. stop the screen sharing. Yes, there there are, and um, maybe you can allow me to turn my video on. Um, and we can get started with the first question, which is how, um, how do you take charitable giving into account with legacy planning? Good question. I will tell you, I'm not quite sure how to turn on your, your video. So I'm gonna answer the question for you. So can you, how do you take into account charitable giving within the legacy planning? Oh, that's a terrific question. For so many of our clients, it's really important to look at what sort of charitable inclinations do you have? What sort of organizations uh, do you wanna support with some of those funds? And, and how is the best way of doing it? There's a number of different ways. One, of course, is to put into your documents that you wanna support an organization and how that would look uh, as far as the, the monetary value around it. Uh, then we can use that some planning tools. You might wanna look at setting up a foundation that's a possibility for some clients. You might want to look at using a donor advised fund. Um, and, and those are both um, tax advantage ways to give to charities. Uh, and you might also want to look like if you're 72 or older using your required minimum distributions um, and give those directly to charity. So there's a number of different aspects to consider when it comes to charitable giving that you want to take into consideration. Again, I would just recommend talk to your financial advisor, whether that's me or somebody else here at the office or, and or your attorney about the best way of setting that up. Um, I do find that most of the times the attorneys more focused on the foundation and on the trust aspect than they are on some of the other aspects. Um, and that's just the nature of, of what's in their wheelhouse. But it's a good question. And a good financial advisor should be able to walk that process with you. Thank you. And I'll encourage everybody, if you have questions, please add them to the chat and we'll roll through them. We have another one here, Mike. Um, what's the difference between revocable and irrevocable trust? Well, that's a good question. There's different types of trust, you know, and, and so what we have with the different trust, and then I didn't pull it up here on the screen because I'm going to show you something, but um, you know, the irrevocable trust is just that. It's irrevocable. Once the assets are put into that trust, you really can't change it. And again, I'm not an estate planning attorney, so I don't draft those documents, but you can you can tell the difference. A revocable trust is normally what we see. A lot of times it will be 
termed a living trust, and uh, and it and it will have um, the ability to be changed. And certain assets might go into the irrevocable trust to keep them out of the estate, uh, and other assets will go into the uh, revocable trust. So won't, some will go in the irrevocable, some will go in revocable, depending on what the goal is. Frequently, we'll see something like life insurance uh, go into its own dedicated trust. Because remember what I said earlier is life insurance is part of your estate, the proceeds of, of that death benefit. While it does pass to your beneficiaries tax-free, if you have a million dollar life insurance policy, uh, that would be calculated as part of your estate. And so um, the benefit of trust is that if you get the right ones in the right place, you can avoid a number of, of issues around the probate process. You can avoid your estate becoming public, and uh, possibly you can have some tax advantages as well, um, depending on what the, the size of your estate is and your net worth. Okay. Uh, that is it for the questions. So thank you for your time today. We'll be emailing out the webinar as Mike had noted earlier. This concludes the program, but if you're interested in speaking with Mike, Emily Moore, our current client development manager will be reaching out with a scheduling link. You can go online and set up a brief introductory conversation. If you're interested in additional information on 360 Financial, our proven life wealth process and high level view of our IQ investment strategy, please stay on this webinar for a few more minutes. Thank you again for your time today. And if you have any further questions, we are here to have a conversation and be a sounding board to learn how we can help you now. And with that, Mike, we can move on um, into the 360 Financial big picture planning. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I went through a couple of disclosure pages that we have to show. Um, now, I will tell you a little bit more about 360. Again, not a commercial here, but we are a registered investment advisory firm. Uh, we have over 500 clients, and uh, we are based in downtown YZ. And we um, have been doing this since 1995. So we have a process built for what we do. And all I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time uh, talking about what that process is. And so, um, and of course, if you have any questions, we can put that into the queue as well, and I can spend a little time answering those. Okay. So you probably noticed already off the bat, we're a little bit different as far as a wealth management firm. I didn't talk to you about investing. I'll show you a little bit how we invest our clients' money. But when we look at the way that we work, our process of working is real simple. We ask the very first question, what matters to you? What's important to you? What are we solving for? But the question of what matters to you usually is focused around a few different pieces. Oops. And it's focused around this piece that matters and this piece that is focused into four different elements. Okay. What matters to our clients mostly is I want to set goals and have, have planning done around my family concerns. I need planning around my occupational goals. Okay. I need planning around my recreational goals. You know, the fun stuff, the bucket list things. What do you want to accomplish uh, as far as something that gives you joy, maybe outside of work or volunteering? And, um, and we want to make sure that we stay focused on these three aspects. Because what we found is that these three aspects really provide the why to all of the planning. You know, and then the money, which frequently a lot of people do first in this process is the how, you know, I always talk about how it's, it's the gas in the engine, you know, it, it propels us, money gives us options, there's no doubt about that. But what we need to do is have the ability to use that money to drive what's important to us the most. And so when we start looking at the issues around what matters, then what we do is we also look at what can we control? Okay. And we know that there's certain things that we can't control. We wish we could control everything. We cannot control if the stock market goes up or down today. Okay. And we know that we can't control if it goes up or down for the year. But what we can control are what I like to call the three Ps. It's the philosophy, of what we do here and our mission is to enrich our clients' lives, as I'll talk about in a second. It's to control the planning process. 
So every six months or once a year, we have a meeting, you come into the office and we review your estate plan, we review your portfolio, we review your, your planning goals. And we dis through that process, we discover what's important to you. We design a plan that meets those needs. And then we deploy or put into action that plan. Okay. And we do this by having a repeatable process. So if I can control the repeatable process, our philosophy, and the planning approach, those are big aspects of control that will help us build a plan that we call the life wealth plan. Okay. We even give you a life wealth organizer that has all the important documents, as well as the planning tools and the, and the, and the goals that were established within this organizer. Okay. But it's really the combination of what matters to you the most and what we can control, that gives us that sweet spot of the planning process. And it's frankly, incredibly remarkable on how well this works when we have, again, the ability to go on a frequent basis to review it. And when we're working on the life wealth plan, we've narrowed it down really to about six impactful financial events that we need to plan around. And 360's mission, as I just mentioned, is to enrich lives. And we do this by helping our clients navigate through these impactful events. And so you'll notice up on the top of the screen, there's retirement. You know, that's, that's a, a financial impactful event for everybody that comes into the office. Okay. Tax strategies, you know, and, and what are some sound tax strategies to take advantage of and when do you take advantage of them? And if we're meeting again on a regular basis, try to make sure that none of these fall between the cracks, okay, because they might be short lived and we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of strategies. I'm not talking about tax returns. Those have to be done every year. Strategies also have to be discussed every year, but it's a different subset from the, the actual return itself investments. We've got to have an investment process. We have bull markets, we have bear markets, we have recessions. Right now, we've been going through a lot of volatility. If you have a disciplined process, and you have a diff disciplined investment strategy, it's something that you can stick through, you know, ups or downs that help you stay focused on your goals. Family security, everything around what I just talked about on the legacy piece falls into the, to the next icon, but family legacy and family security often are intertwined. You know, if you have younger kids, college might be a scenario where you want to look at how do I create security for my family by giving the gift of education? What would happen to me if I, if I passed away or if I um, was disabled? Do I have that risk covered? A lot of people say, well, that must be insurance you're talking about. It's also risk management. How do we make sure that those aspects of the unforeseen that might occur are addressed in the planning? Just like in the legacy piece, I've just spent the last 40 minutes talking about, you know, around inheritance and gifting and, and, and how does that work within you and your spouse's needs um, for, the, you know, the next phase of that planning process. And then for a lot of our clients, because we do work with a number of business owners and successful professionals, buying and selling a business and making decisions within that business to help grow their wealth is something that's very important. Okay. So these critical and impactful financial events is what the whole planning process is structured around. And of course, we do have an investment approach and, and we utilize this approach by building portfolios that are customized for our clients based on the written investment policy statement that we generate for them. So it's kind of taken the institutional approach or even the foundation type of approach where you build an investment policy statement, we bring it to the family level. And then once we're at that approach, we build a portfolio typically of low cost exchange traded funds and institutional funds um, to build what we call the foundation. And then we build a leadership. And the foundation piece is really focused around dividend paying stocks, large companies that are dominators in their field, the innovators that are growing faster than everybody else. 
And time to time, we look at alternatives to see what's in the landscape that might benefit our clients. And then at the bottom of that pie is the fixed income piece of the portfolio. As interest rates have been rising this year, the fixed income piece has really been struggling, but also the yields now are higher in that piece than they were three months ago or even 12 months ago. Uh, so there's potentially a need for all these elements to be mixed in an asset allocation that's appropriate for that client. And then we supplement this foundational approach with a leadership approach. And simply what we're doing here is we're trying to determine who and what areas of the, the economy and the stock market are leading you know, the, and, and they have the best potential for growth. And so that can lead to different areas of the, of the marketplace, energy, healthcare, semiconductors, uh, maybe home builders at one time, internet stocks at another time, uh, gold, um, which also kind of falls into the alternative space, you know, th again, at a, at a different time. And so this leadership approach uh, is, is really trying to focus on where is there some opportunities within the investment world. So yes, we do have an investment process. And when we go through the critical financial planning pieces, we really focus on this process called the life wealth process. First meeting with a client, potential client, I should say, is, is this what we call a fit meeting? You know, and, and, it's, and it's really a checkup. You know, how, how do your needs as a potential client match up with what we do here as a firm? And, and let's see if there's a, a fit, you know? And if there's a mutual fit after an hour conversation, we'll move into either another type of fit meeting where we talk a little bit more about how we think we can help you as a client, or we moved into a go meeting or a get organized. The get organized meeting then is where we have you bring in statements, bring in your tax returns, bring in your estate planning documents, bring in your life insurance documents, and we start organizing all that to get ready for building out this life wealth organizer. Okay. Once we get through that process and we've put together a plan for you, we're going to set that plan in motion. And so the motion or the implementation is crucial. If you build the most beautiful plan in the world and you have a blueprint of a dream house, but you never pour the foundation or start building, all you have is something on paper, you know, but in the planning process, setting in motion is critical. And not only setting it in motion, but like I said earlier, it's the reviewing and realigning of what's important to you, what matters to you, what's changed in your life. Do we have to change any of their planning documents? Do we have to change your asset allocation? Do we have to change something because one of your adult children needs some help that wasn't expected? You know, the review and the realign is, is critical to a successful plan. So in a nutshell, our clients go through this process with us. And then it basically just kind of starts over again as we have more and more conversations about what's changed in their life. So I would recommend if this process makes sense to you and you want to have a conversation, then, you know, just reach out when Emily, you know, calls or contacts you via email and schedule a time to have this forum conversation. You know, it will take about 30 minutes, maybe 60, depending on how far we go into details and what you want to talk about. But it's a scenario for us to hear what matters to you. It's a scenario where you get to hear a little bit more of how we work. And we can determine after that meeting if it makes sense to take a next step or not. Okay. I've been doing this for a long time. You know, at the end of the day, we don't need to like strong arm you to become a client. That doesn't work. We believe if we have good conversations about family, occupation, recreation, and money. We will build a foundation for a long-term relationship with our client. And, and frankly, that's why we have frequently multiple generations of clients. So this is a discussion, a conversation that may benefit you, may benefit us, but we won't know until actually after we have the meeting. So look forward to potentially hearing from you down the road. Yes, so I will say thank you all for your time today. If, if you do have any additional questions about estate planning or otherwise, please feel free to reach out to myself or Mike. Um, otherwise, you can expect a follow-up from myself, Troni, 
uh, with the webinar and the, uh, the documents that we had mentioned earlier. And Emily Moore, our client development manager, will be reaching out to you as well. So thank you again for your time and uh, hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Yep, thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.